The next few moments are devoted to silent prayer, giving each of you the privacy of your priesthood to name your sins to God. If we name our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to purify us from all wrongdoing. When we name our sins to God, we are filled with God the Holy Spirit. God the Holy Spirit is our mentor and our teacher, and the one who brings to our memory those things we have forgotten. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and biblical truth. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, let us pray. Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity to assemble ourselves together under the principle of freedom so that we might learn the word of God. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us and give us the concentration necessary to assemble this portion of the word into our souls. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. Now we're dealing with the subject of divorce, uh, but uh, in order for, especially you young people who aren't married yet, in order for uh, you to avoid the likelihood of divorce, there are some uh, certain, uh, well, there's a checklist you should make for yourself, a compatibility checklist. And from this checklist, uh, you uh, will be able to uh, uh, have a, a better marriage if you find someone uh, from this compatibility uh, checklist. And you should always, uh, especially when it comes to meeting someone, uh, you might be attracted to them at first because they are handsome, cute, or because uh, the girl is knocked down gorgeous. But then when you go on a date with her and get to know her, you must understand a few things on this uh, compatibility checklist. First of all, you must understand whether they've been saved. Have they believed in Christ? Have they been saved by faith alone in Christ alone? So you must understand if your uh, partner is a believer the one you're dating. And if they're not a believer and you give them the gospel and they still don't believe, well, that person is not for you. And they and that's one of the, uh, the most important of the compatibility checklist. And if they're not saved and they care not for uh, the gospel message, then run from that person. They're not for you. I don't care how good they look. I don't care how cute and sweet they are. I don't care how beautiful they are. If you decide to go against God's mandate not to marry an unbeliever and you become unequally yoked, you will be punished. And most of it will be self-induced punishment. And you had it coming to you because you heard the message not to do it, but you do it anyway. And then the second of the compatibility list. This is the second most important thing to know. And you must have an understanding or an agreement as to what constitutes the Christian way of life. Having an understanding or an agreement as to what constitutes the Christian way of life. And this means if uh, you uh, believe that uh, salvation is by grace, and if you believe that living this uh, spiritual life is by grace, and you marry someone who says, well, I've believed in Christ, but I must uh, work and do this all the time and work in the energy of the flesh and go around and witnessing all day. And if you do not agree with that uh, function, and if you say that's not the Christian way of life, the Christian way of life is by grace. Of course, it includes witnessing as a mandate. Once you know how to witness, you don't, you don't witness... Uh, before you know how. We'll study that in Matthew when our Lord would always tell the people whom he healed they were new believers. And he said, uh, don't tell anyone about it. He said, I've healed you. Go, go to the priest and all of that, but don't tell anyone about it. And he would tell them that because they were ignorant of the word. Uh, they were saved, but they wouldn't know how to accurately communicate it yet. So he didn't want the whole world getting confused with uh, their nonsense. So if you, uh, under point two, if you do not have an understanding or an agreement as to what constitutes the Christian way of life, uh, that you're going to have trouble if you marry that person, even if they are a believer. Just because you find someone and you say, aha, they're a believer, I'm going to make it, it's not necessarily true. That person might have a completely different idea of what the Christian way of life is. And they may be Pentecostal. And they may think that the Christian way of life is to run up and down the aisles and shout hallelujah and to do that. And if you don't agree with that, 
Well, you're going to have to let that person in freedom go the way they want to go if you get married. And it's going to bother you. So in that will be self-induced misery. So you must know someone before you marry them, especially with regard to their spiritual status. Are they saved and are they growing in grace and in knowledge? Now, of course, this isn't foolproof, but it's a, a much better way than to just get somebody because of their superficial ality and how they look and whether they're a hunk or not or whether they're beautiful or not. Now, it's not foolproof because you could meet someone who has believed in Christ. And you could meet someone who's growing in grace and in knowledge. And then you get married. And then maybe 10 years down the road, they change their mind about doctrine and say, I don't want that anymore. I'm going somewhere else. I've seen it happen. And that's outside of your control. But if you're growing in grace, you'll be able to handle it beautifully. So it's not a, a foolproof thing because just because they're positive at one point toward the word doesn't mean they're always going to be positive. And they may be positive for uh, 20 years and then go into reversionism and then come back to the Word. There's no way to know what people are going to do with their volition. And that's because we are depraved and we have a choice in life to make. But this is the best way of uh, having a successful marriage. So you understand or have an agreement on what constitutes the Christian way of life. You have an understanding and agreement as to your local church preference. If one person goes to one church, if you meet someone and well, let's say you go out with a girl and she's believed in Christ and you tell her, well, I've been going to the little Bible doctrine church and I'm getting a lot of food there as per the word of, the, as per the word of God and I'm learning a lot of things. I would like uh, you to visit this church uh, to see if you like it. And if uh, she comes there and says, no, I like my church better, well, then you're going to have a difficulty in marriage because you're going to want her to go to your local church and she's going to want you to go to her local church and it's going to cause friction. So you must have an agreement on that before marriage. And you can figure all of this out during the dating process. This is why it's so important not to jump into marriage, not to just because she's beautiful and you say, well, she's a believer, I can marry her. Well, that's true. But you jump into marriage and then... Uh, She's off at her Pentecostal church and you're at Bible Doctrine Church. Well, there's conflict there, a natural conflict. And so that, uh, that type of a marriage, you may make it work if you have enough, uh, if you're spiritually mature enough to handle such a situation. But it's going to grind on your nerves, I guarantee it. Especially when you're learning all these phenomenal things and they're not. And you're going to want to have a compatibility in that. You want to be able to go home and say, wow, did you hear that message? And you're going to want to be able to go home and say, I want to live the Christian way of life as it's presented in grace. But if you, if you can't run home and talk about the same things and have that compatibility with regard to spirituality, you really have a shallow marriage. And so always uh, make sure of these things. Make sure that uh, you're going to have the same local church. And if you decide to marry and they go to a different church and you knew about it, well, you have nothing to say, and you can't nag them into your church. You've got to give them freedom. You chose to marry them knowing who they were and what they were all about. Now, now all of a sudden, you, now that you're married, you want to mold them into the way you want them. Well, they were always that way. You just got to open your eyes and get to know the person. And if, it's not, if they're not compatible, well, God will send you someone who is compatible. Don't jump the gun. And don't say, i got to get married right now. All my friends are getting married. It would be so terrible I'm going to be an old maid. Well, it's better to be a happy old maid than an unhappy person in marriage. I guarantee you that. So you must have a, a soul compatibility. A soul compatibility. And what is that? Well, what's your priorities in life? What are your priorities and what are their priorities? Is their priority, number one, to learn the Word of God? You see, you might meet a Christian who uh, would, it's, they're all right with the Word of God, but they're not that enthused about it. In other words, they could uh, just as easily be watching a television show and it wouldn't strike their conscience as going to church. And it's not that they hate the Word of God, they're just, they just like entertainment better. Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. So, uh, if you must know what their priorities are. Is their pri what their priorities are. Is their priority Bible doctrine number one? Is your priority Bible doctrine number one? 
That will be compatibility. Now, if it's the other way around, let's say your priority, Bible doctrine, is number 50. You'll go when you feel like it. Yours is down the line about number 50. And let's say her priority is number one for Bible doctrine. Well, there'll be conflict there. You would be more compatible with someone who, di who didn't care for the word because that person who cares for the word is going to have a natural conflict with you. So they're going to be excited about it. And your number one priority, what do people do with their number one priority? They talk about it. For example, if you like flying and you're a pilot, when you get around your buddies, usually those buddies are going to like flying too. So you have something to talk about, a compatibility. And in marriage, the best thing is to have compatibility. And the best marriages are, well, they're best described as conversations that never end. Because you both have the same priorities. You can both talk about the same things that you love. In this case, and the most important thing, Bible doctrine. So you have a compatibility, a rapport. And you both uh, begin to have a deeper type of love. And the woman begins to have a deep respect for her husband because she loves the Word of God. She sees how her husband loves the Word of God, so she respects him for it. And then he sees how the woman loves the Word of God. He loves the Word of God, so he loves her for it. There's a compatibility. And if you don't have that compatibility, you might have a marriage that lasts, but it's going to be shallow. And it's really not going to have any meaning, especially in the spiritual realm. So what is their general mental attitude? Your attitudes uh, must, uh, ha there must be compatibility there. I mean, if you uh, get with somebody who has a mental attitude of always complaining or always whining about things or always wanting things to be different or better or how they see it or always thinking that the grass is greener on the other side when it's not, but if you have someone who is never pleased, that type of mental attitude, a rotten mental attitude, well, then you're going to live in misery because either the husband is going to nag the wife to death or the wife will nag the husband to death because they want to complain. Now, if you're both complainers, well, I guess you do have some rapport there. It's a pretty pathetic rapport, but if you uh, both uh, like to complain and come home after work and she likes to talk about the little ninnies at the office and you like to talk about all the guys at the office, well, there's compatibility in gossip, maligning, and judging. There's compatibility in sin natures, too. And so uh, that, that's one of them that I didn't list, but there is a compatibility in that. Do you both have the same trend of the sin nature? If one person has a trend toward legalism and the other one toward antinomianism, there is going to be a conflict. You see, the one person has a trend toward antinomianism. Now, they wouldn't think twice about uh, getting drunk on occasion, or they wouldn't think twice about raising a little hell. But then the other person well, wants to be a legalist, and yet the antinomian person says, well, I would never uh, hang around those nosy people always talking about each other. These people get on my nerves. So uh, your relationships in life will be different. She'll have uh, the types of friends you don't like, and you'll have the types of friends she doesn't like because usually people pick friends based on their sin nature lineup. Are they antinomian? Yeah, I am too. Let's go raise some hell. Are they legalist? Yeah, I am too. Let's go talk about the neighbors. And that's usually the way it lines up. But uh, the best... Uh, the most optimum thing would be for both of you to love the Word of God, to be that uh, new creature through living the unique spiritual life, and that way you do have a compatibility that's spiritual and doesn't have to do with uh, sin. Then there is a physical compatibility. That's about uh, the last thing on the list, physical compatibility. But, of course, it is there. I mean, you cannot say it's not there. It is a part of it because uh, if you're not attracted to the person, if you're not attracted to their appearance and their grooming, etc., or their dress, well, it's, pro you're not gonna, it's probably not going to be a too good of a marriage. But what often happens is uh, you might make a friend who's a girl. And, you, and she might be your friend, not a girlfriend, but just your friend. And you two might start to discover things in each other that you've never discovered before. And maybe both of you weren't that attracted to each other to start with. But then through conversation 
and through getting to know how this person thinks and you say, wow, you think like I do. Wow, we have great compatibility. Well, the next thing you know, you've fallen in love. And then comes the physical attraction. It's happened that way before. But there is physical attraction involved in marriage. You can't get around that. Otherwise, it's just friendship. If there's no physical attraction and you have rapport, that's called friendship. So I'm not telling you to go pick the ugliest person in the world and marry them. Ugly to you. You see, it's all in the eye of the beholder. So uh, then we have economic compatibility. And that means is there agreement on how money is going to be administered? Is there a premarital agreement so that the man cannot touch the woman's money after marriage? Because a lot of times the woman might have a, a load of money. And then the man gets married to her and he thinks he has rights to all of it and he's going to go out and gamble it all or he's going to go out and make even more money through his investments and all of that using all of her money. That is, before the marriage, she's very wealthy. And a lot of men, just like women, will marry a man for being wealthy. There are a few men who marry women for wealth. And usually it's a young stud marrying an older woman and he's doing it for her money. So is there compatibility? Is there an agreement? You know, how, how are we going to use our funds? And this is important, but usually it works out if you have a, a, the same type of spiritual life lining up. Uh, but it's important to also have economic compatibility because some of the biggest fights in the world originate from money. And if, yeah, if one day you're both, you've both ran out of money, and she wants to go out and buy her favorite thing, and you want to go out and buy your favorite thing when you both should be sitting at home and not spending a dime, well, then there's going to be conflict, naturally. So there must be an agreement on that. And there should be an agreement on whether the wife will work or not. Now, in some cases, in poverty, the wife must work. And in some cases, both man and woman work. But there are ways to arrange it to where uh, when you get married, the man says, all right, I'm going to be the one who works, and I want you to stay home because I want you to raise the children. And that's perfectly fine, and that's the way it works. A lot of women say, no, I want to be independent. Well, you chose to marry the man, and you should have a thought about this before getting with that man. And so there should be an agreement on the rearing and the training of children. There will be a lot of conflict if there's not agreement in that area. For example, you might be a person who disciplines lightly, and the other person might be a person who has a heavy hand in discipline. Well, you're going to have to come together and have some agreement, and it would be wise to write down a policy because you don't want to confuse the children. And you see what happens is the children are smart. They figure out how to play one of the parents off the other. And they'll say, well, this one's going to be harsh with me today, but this one's going to be easy on me because they're not mad at me, but the other one is. So I'll ask Dad this time. But then when Dad's mad, you'll say, oh, I, I'll ask Mom this time. And you start to play off of each other. Well, it becomes a problem in marriage for the, for the mother and father because, uh, well, they might be competing for the child's love, but what it should, what there should happen is you both have a list and you follow it strictly. When they do this, this is the discipline. When they do that, this is the discipline. And you both, if one decides to discipline in a certain way, you both better back each other up. Otherwise, they'll get very smart and play you off of each other and there will be conflict. So this is just common sense and it's a, a part of compatibility. Then there is family compatibility. There should be an agreement on the desirability of children. And usually uh, the, the girl will say, I want to have children. Well, if you're a guy and you say, I don't want to have children, I never want to have children, there's a lack of compatibility there and there's a danger in that because if the woman has always wanted children and you say, no way, she's going to resent you for it, especially when she gets older. And she sees all the other women with their children, and she's going to say, I wish I could have had a child. And she'll start to resent you for it. So you must have an agreement of, on this. And if both of you say, no, not right now, we don't want children, well, that's, that's fine. But then you might talk later and say, well, yeah, we want children now. But there must be a compatibility with that, definitely. And usually this is an issue that sticks harder with the woman than the man. 
The man usually probably doesn't want children, or he might, or he just might not care, and the woman usually does. It just depends on the personality. There should uh, be and uh, uh, there should be a stability compatibility as well, and this has to do with uh, is that person you've been dating does she act kind of neurotic or psychotic? Does she uh, is that guy that you're marrying? Does he all of a sudden become very uh, compulsive? Does he all of a sudden become very obsessive with you? That's a sign that he might have some problems mentally. And this is, uh, a lot of women fall into this. He starts out very nice and very sweet and then becomes very obsessive. And everything you do, he's got to know what you're doing at what time you're doing it. He's got to know everything in your life that's going on, who you're talking to, who your friends are. You can't do this. You can't do that. becomes very obsessive. These types of men, usually, these types of men, until they grow up, usually become the type that stalk. So you must have an idea. Are they stable or are they unstable? Are they neurotic? Are they psychotic? And I've heard a lot of guys, especially when I was a teenager, date a teenage girl, and they would come back from the date and say, that girl was crazy. Well, she just moody as all get out. I've had that experience. They're just nuts. And you just said, wow, this person's crazy. Well, you're not going to have compatibility with someone who is sweet with you for an hour, and then for the next hour, she treats you like a bag of doggy do. And then for the next hour, she's sweet again. But that's very difficult to deal with. And so if they're, if they're neurotic or if they are drug dependent, if they have a drug problem, definitely avoid that. And that's common sense. Or if they are a compulsive gambler and spend all the money all the time compulsively gambling. Not, you can gamble and go to Vegas with a limited amount and have fun. But compulsive gambling is a problem, most definitely, and a sin because you wouldn't be providing for your family. But for just a regular gambling with uh, some discretionary money that you have left over, that you really don't have anything else you want to do with it, that's fine. We can't go overboard with it, though, just like we can't really go overboard with anything in life, whether it's eating too much or drinking too much. Uh, there must be a stability. So now we're looking at the dissolution of marriage by death. We already talked about how adultery is a reason for uh, divorce and remarriage. But that is only for the innocent party, not the guilty party. If the guilty party commits adultery, they don't have the right of remarriage. But if the innocent party commits adultery, they, or does not, the innocent party hasn't committed adultery, but if they know the guilty party has and they decide to get a divorce and then get remarried, that's perfectly le legitimate according to Scripture. Romans chapter 7, verse 2, verse 3. This is where it deals with death of a spouse dissolves the marriage. Romans 7, 2 through 3. And you might be saying, I thought we were studying Matthew. What's this all about divorce? Well, just in the last verse, in the last hour, our, our Lord brought up divorce in Matthew chapter 5, verse 32. So now I'm explaining to you divorce as it is given to us in the Bible. For example, a married woman is bound by the law to her husband as long as he is alive. But if her husband dies, she is released from the law, the contract of marriage. So then if she marries another man while her husband is still alive, she is classified as an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is released from the contract and is not an adulteress even though she marries another man. And as I told you in the last hour, some people make a big issue out of their family members. One of them has a death and then they run out and get married maybe six months later and everybody gossips. Oh, that body's not even cold yet. Well, guess what? The Bible says they can remarry. So leave it and let them make their own decisions, whether it's foolish or not. You have no right of gossip or maligning or even getting involved. They are free to remarry. In fact, according to this law, they are free to remarry the next day. Now, it would be stupid, and, it, and you might be tempted to gossip and say, that woman's body is still warm, and she is going to, and he is just going to go out and marry somebody the next day. He has the right according to Scripture. Now, it would not be wise. It would probably be wise to wait about a year because you, you'll probably be devastated, if you're normal, by the death of your spouse. 
Now, I've known some people that would celebrate, but that's different. Uh, it's, it's usually a normal thing when the death of the spouse occurs that, uh, well, there's a time of mourning. And, of course, that's natural. And uh, usually the rule of law is wait about a year or even longer so you can uh, get over that so that you won't, every time you go on a date, be thinking about your a wife or your husband who has passed away. And it does take time, and I'm not advocating you to get married right off, absolutely not. I'm just telling you that if you do, it is perfectly legal according to Scripture. And this illustration applies equally to both uh, men and women, even though it's focusing on the woman. Now, personal love outside of the integrity envelope. Remember the integrity envelope. Impersonal, God, personal love for God the Father and impersonal love for mankind. Personal love uh, toward other people outside of that becomes dangerous and because you will uh, fall in love for all the wrong reasons outside of the integrity envelope. And there's nothing more dangerous than falling in love with half, while you have no integrity. And that's the problem with not only unbelievers, but it's definitely a problem with believers today. We've got entire churches across the country designed as a lonely hearts club. Why do you go to church? I want to meet that right person. Are you going to church for the word of God? What's that? No, they're going to meet the right person. And it usually ends up in disaster. And if you say, well, I don't think so, then tell me why Christians have a 50% divorce rate if that's not the case. If they were getting with the Word of God, their marriages would be working out. If they were getting with the Word of God, their family life would be working out. Seek ye first the kingdom of heaven, and all these things will be added unto you. They could care less about the kingdom of heaven. They could care less about learning Bible doctrine. All they want is a social life. Well, have fun, because it's the only fun you're going to have, and then you're going to be miserable. Absolutely, totally miserable miserable <clears throat> hey. hey we're in the middle of church uh, I'll, I'll sit in, or... sure come on in Thank you. so again this illustration applies equally to the man and the woman if the woman is not willing to submit to the authority of the man during a courtship then she should never marry that man because remember, in the Old Testament, as well as the New Testament, the man was given authority over the woman. It's always been that way. Adam was the authority over Eve. And if during courtship you are uh, with this man, and if this, uh, you can't respect this man, then, well, don't marry him. And if you can't obey him, or if you look at him and say, I can't obey this jerk, well, don't marry that jerk by all means. So 1 Corinthians chapter 7 verse 39 says this, and this is dealing with uh, marriage, of course, and talking about when the spouse dies, you have the right of remarriage. A wife is bound to her husband as long as he lives. If, however, the husband dies, she is free to be married to whomever she wills, but only in the Lord. If a husband or wife dies, the survive, surviving spouse is free to remarry and age is not an issue. You know, it, it amazes me, the rudeness of some people. I need to get a little tougher sometimes. And maybe we should start locking the doors after a certain time because uh, some people are just rude. So the surviving spouse is free to remarry, but only under the leading of the Lord. That is, don't just hop into something. And make sure you're doing the right thing. Ordinarily, so let's look at Deuteronomy chapter 24, 1 through 4. And this deals with a divorce as it's listed in the Old Testament. Divorce as it's listed in the Old Testament, Deuteronomy 24, 1 through 4. When a man takes a wife and he marries her, 
And it comes to pass that she finds no favor in his eyes because he has found in her a matter of shame. Actually, what you see there is a matter of nakedness. Now, this doesn't deal with, although if you were to see it and say a matter of nakedness, she must have been committing adultery. This isn't what it refers to. If there is a matter of shame in her, then he writes her a certificate of divorce and he places it in her hands and he sends her out of the house. Now, how do I know it's not adultery? Because if it were adultery, then the woman would be stoned. That's the way they did it in the Old Testament. They didn't fool around. Now, we don't do it today, and you can thank God for that. But in the Old Testament, if you committed adultery, you were stoned. So the fact that he just sends her out of the house means that this isn't related to adultery. This is related to some superficial reason, some matter of shame. And usually it would refer to adultery, but of course, uh, since this uh, since there's no stoning involved, there's no way this in Deuteronomy 24, 1 through 4 refers to that. The rabbinical school of Hillel, that is the Hebrews, they interpreted this as meaning divorce for a flimsy reason. Anything that displeases the husband. For example, uh, she, she might eat or cause her husband to eat food that had not been first tied. And that was in the Old Testament. It means uh, she didn't pay taxes. So uh, she has dishonored her husband in that way. So he says, all right, I'm getting a divorce. Well, it's a flimsy reason. And then the second is by not keeping a temple vow. This might be what it's referring to. It's not very specific. But these are some of the flimsy reasons they could come up with. Or by walking in public with her hair down. Something that was... Uh, something that might displease the man in those days. Or by flirting with a man. Maybe she just flirted with a man. And so he says, all right, you flirted with that guy. I divorce you. A flimsy reason, but they could do it. If the, ma if the man found a woman who was more beautiful, another flimsy reason. This phrase is also found in Deuteronomy 23, 14. Therefore, he, the Lord, must not see a matter of nakedness that means anything indecent among you and turn away from you. This, this use also does not refer to adultery. And that's just showing you the fact that it has nothing to do with adultery. The best translation for this phrase would be a matter of shame or a matter of dishonor. And if you know what a matter of nakedness means, then of course you could translate it that way. So whatever is meant by a matter of shame is really not known, but it was understood at the time. Then in Deuteronomy 23, 15 through 16, it defines in some detail a matter of dishonor or shame as simply returning as an escaped slave. It was dishonorable to return as an escaped slave to the owner. That is, it was dishonorable to the slave. Becoming a cult prostitute was a matter of shame, of course. And also a matter of shame was a not paying your taxes, Deuteronomy 23, 18. And also, uh, if you were going to be a homosexual prostitute, which they did have, that would be a matter of shame. But there was a legal and civil procedure for divorce in the Old Testament. The civil case was tried by a Levite, the, the priestly tribe. And divorce was a civil matter. Divorce was always a civil matter. When it came to adultery... It was a criminal matter. Because remember, do not commit adultery. Part of the Ten Commandments. Now I'm talking about in the age of Israel. It was a criminal matter. Even today it might be, but it's not. It doesn't hold the penalty that it used to hold. And back then, in the criminal matter, the woman would be brought out if she committed adultery and would be stoned to death along with the man who was caught with her. Or the other way around. They would be stoned to death. So this shows how rare divorce, even they still did it, but it shows how rare adultery would be. So we can also deduce from this verse that divorce was totally legal under certain circumstances called matters of shame. I mean, it was perfectly legal, but they did not have the right of remarriage. The right of remarriage, as we studied last time, is related to about uh, three different things. Adultery, and abandonment 
and one other which we'll get to. But this became a gimmick for the people in Israel just as it is a gimmick today. People getting divorced for any reason. But see, people today get divorced for any reason and think they have the right of remarriage and they don't. Only if the woman had committed adultery, the man has the right of remarriage. If the man committed adultery, the woman had the right of remarriage. First divorce, of course, then remarriage. Or death, then the right of remarriage. Or abandonment, if suddenly the husband just leaves you and you don't know where he is and he's gone and he's abandoned you or vice versa, you too have the right of remarriage in those three cases. And you say, what about abuse, getting beat up? Well, you have the right of divorce, but not remarriage, not until the man remarries. And by re when the man remarries, he's actually committed adultery, and the first marriage has been dissolved. So then you have the right of remarriage. So the divorce gimmick is just for any reason getting uh, a divorce. But you don't have the right of remarriage, not under God's mandates. The divorce gimmick seeks a, a superficial type reason. Uh, for example, uh, the woman might be interested in another man, so she divorces her husband. And, and she might give a silly reason like, we're just not compatible anymore. Well, really, she's fallen in love with someone else. It's a gimmick, though. And she may not have committed adultery yet, but she gets a divorce, and then she goes ahead and uh, marries someone else. And when she does, she might think she's in the right, and she might think that she has slid around the law or found a loophole, but she hasn't. Because when she remarries, not only does she commit adultery, but she causes the other man to commit adultery for that one time. And then, of course, the first marriage is dissolved. So the divorce gimmick is a sly, self-justification type of way to get rid of an unwanted spouse. And the husband might have some stupid pretext to divorce the wife simply because he's found somebody more beautiful and vice versa. So verse 2, and when she leaves his house and goes her way and becomes the wife of another man. Now this is dealing with uh, the innocent victim of a divorce gimmick. She leaves the house and goes her way and becomes the wife of another man. And she did so because she used the divorce gimmick. She went up to her husband and said, I'm not compatible with you. She went up to her husband and said, uh, you just don't treat me the way you used to. I want a divorce. What really in the back of her mind, she's thinking of someone else. And then she divorces and thinks she's pure as the wind-driven snow. And, but when she remarries, well, she's just committed adultery because she does not have the right of remarriage. So divorce, you have many reasons for divorce, even given in the Old Testament. Many of them very superficial reasons like the one where the woman doesn't wear down her hair in public and the man says, I want a divorce. Well, they would grant it to him. A very superficial reason for divorce. But he would not have the right of remarriage. So today, people get divorced and remarried and divorced and remarried. Well, they don't even know the rules behind it all. Matthew 19.8. This is when our Lord said in Matthew chapter 19, verse 8. Because of your hardness of heart, that is, your scar tissue of the soul, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives. Now this is a Jesus Christ talking to the Pharisees because he's really been tough on this and he's told them the exact way that, hey, actually he's insulted them. He's already told them. He's already insulted them in Matthew chapter 5 by saying, uh, yeah, you've heard it said not to commit adultery, and all of you sit here and say, I've never done that. But you've done it in your heart, you sinners. Well, that offended them. And then he brings out the fact that, well, a lot of those Pharisees and experts in the law would get married and divorced and remarried and divorced and remarried several times. So they were offended when he said, well, you just can't uh, get a divorce and remarry and think you're so holy. You think you're so great and you think you're getting into heaven by following the Mosaic law? And what have you done? You've been married five times and you haven't followed the mandate. So it insulted them. So they're trying to insult Jesus back. And they're saying, okay, well, uh, what about Moses? Who said they could have a certificate of divorce. And he said, that's true. And then in Matthew 5, he talks about not having the right of remarriage. And here he says, because of your hardness of heart. 
that is scar tissue of the soul, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives. So what does he do here? He insults the religious people all over again. They're trying to trap him in something. And he just comes back and says, hey, it's your hardness of heart because you're sinners and because you are depraved, because you are gross people, then you, uh, well, then you, uh, you have a hard heart and you are permitted to divorce your wives. So that's all that Jesus was saying to them. Okay, uh, Deuteronomy uh, 24, 3 gives you two reasons for dissolving a marriage under the Mosaic law. There's an illegal reason. Her husband hates her. He just hates her, so he says, I hate you, I divorce you, her. And then a legal reason, her husband dies. Now in verse 4, then her husband, then her first husband, who previously divorced her, is forbidden to marry her again. Since she has been defiled, for that is an abomination before the Lord. Therefore, you will not bring sin into the land which the Lord your God gives you as an inheritance. Now, she's not defiled in the sense that she's done something wrong. It means that uh, she's had sex uh, with her second husband. That means it's permanently destroyed the authority of her first husband. Therefore, the Bible tells her you cannot go back to your first husband after divorcing your second husband. You've been defiled. And, it, and a lot of people do this as well. Uh, they are married to their uh, first husband, get a divorce from their first husband, and get married to someone else. And then that, that marriage with someone else doesn't work out, and they say to themselves, you know what, I was better off with my first husband. So they divorce their second husband, try to get back with the first husband. You can't do that. It's, a, it's, 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 an, it's an abomination before the Lord. So uh, that it, remar actually remarrying after remarrying the same person you divorced is forbidden and shouldn't be done. So she's not defiled in the sense she's done something wrong. It doesn't mean that uh, because she got a divorce, she might have had a legitimate reason. Maybe her husband committed adultery and she got a divorce. And then she got remarried. Perfectly legal. So it's not that she's done anything wrong. It's just that she's had sex with her second husband, dissolved the marital bonds with her first husband, and it'll never be the same if she goes back with him. Therefore, the Bible says, never go back to your first husband after divorcing your second husband. The first husband's authority has been destroyed, and he will be vulnerable to your sins of hatred, revenge, jealousy, bitterness, as well as he will have feelings of hatred, revenge, jealousy, bitterness, vindictiveness. And why will he have those feelings? Well, he'll be jealous of the second husband. So these things occur, and he will be hypersensitive uh, regarding his sexual ability uh, in comparison with the other husband. He'll always be wanting to compare and contrast. And he'll always uh, be thinking, uh, why did she leave me and go with him anyway? And it's just going to cause bitterness, and it's not going to work out. It's not going to be the same the second time around. So the phrase, you will not bring sin into the land, includes concepts of criminality. And in this case, would be adultery, because criminality is related to adultery, or the violation of the civil law as divorce as a gimmick. They would violate civil law in some cases by uh, using divorce as a gimmick. So degeneracy is under a pattern of implode, explode, and revert. And what this means is, well, it, it goes very well in our country. And the reason why there is so much divorce and remarriage and divorce again and remarriage and why so many people are unhappy in marriage is because they haven't gotten with the Word of God and they've moved into what is called degeneracy. And this country has become degenerate, very degenerate. When marriage falls apart, the country falls apart because the family falls apart. All of these are divine institutions and it's the foundation of all civilization that is marriage. And without it, the only hope is Bible doctrine. So implode, explode, and revert means... Well, uh, you, you go under degeneracy because you're always feeling jealous. 
Are you going from woman to woman? Or you go back to one woman? Or you go from man to man and go back to one man? It's going to create mental attitude sins. It's going to create incompatibility. And there's going to be a lot of strife and a lot of fighting. And why do a lot of people get divorced? because of strife and fighting and they have no control over their tongue and the little lady likes to talk bad about the husband and the husband likes to talk bad about the little lady. Well, that's not the Christian way of life. And there are Christians, sadly enough, who can't even function in a marriage. There are unbelievers I know, unbelievers who know nothing of Christ, who have had better marriages than many believers I know. It's a, it is a condemnation on us. Not on us personally, per se. We might be doing the right thing. But on us as a country. On us as a country filled with Christians. It is a condemnation that an unbelieving uh, marriage, two unbelievers get along better than two believers because they don't know how to function outside of the sin nature and they're always in strife. They don't even know rebound. They don't know what 1 John 1, 9 is. And if they even heard it, they would reject it. Well, what's that all about? Never heard that before. Well, you've never seen it in the Bible, you idiot. You don't even know what it means, but they don't care. So their marriages fall apart. And then their children grow up, and their children turn out to be idiots, and they wonder why. Well, I wonder why. You didn't get with the word. That's why. It's sad today that people cannot wake up to the word of God and it is destroying our country. And I feel sorry for all of us because we will live if we live long enough. Some of us might be graced out and taken off the earth. But we, if we live long enough and if we live a normal lifespan, all of us here are going to live long enough to see some terrible things happen to our country. You want to, you're going to see a crime rate that's going to skyrocket because there's no family. There's no authority. How can children have authority orientation when the mother's running down the father and the father's running down the mother because they've gotten a divorce? Well, they don't know where to turn. And then they turn to the schools, and the schools don't teach them how to read and write even. And many of them graduate uh, with a diploma that they can't even read. So then they turn to Uncle Sam. Well, I have nowhere to go. Uh, Uncle Sam, give me security. My parents didn't give me security. My schools didn't give me security. Now it's your turn, government. Give me security. And then the whole country goes towards socialism. And the whole economy collapses. And then we have no military. Uh, what kind of fighting young men are we going to have when they've grown up under such superficial silliness? What if all of a sudden they had to draft all of these uh, young men who had uh, lived in a where, where the family was split apart and they were constantly bickering and they had to live part of the time with mommy and part of the time with daddy. If you've ever had to do that, it's not your fault. It's not a condemnation on you. It's a condemnation on another generation that didn't get with the word of God. Now, in some cases, there are legitimate reasons for divorce. And there's always been divorce. And in the 1950s, there was some divorce. But now it's so widespread, it's a symptom of something very serious. It's a symptom that people lack something in their souls. There's no soul compatibility. There's just a bunch of sin natures running around nitpicking at each other. Now, I would venture out to say that probably 80% of the people here in Anderson are believers in Christ. And probably 50 to 60% of them are divorced. Why? Shouldn't they be able to live with somebody else without having that strife? Well, if they were living their spiritual life, they could. And yet they'll look down their nose at everyone. They're covered in dung and they can't even smell themselves. And they'll look down their nose at everyone and gossip and judge someone, someone because of the way they act or the way they sound, or they'll gossip and malign and judge them. Well, they'll look at somebody, go to the store and, and buy some wine, and they'll say, look at that sinner. And yet they can't even keep their marriages together. Who are they? They're covered in stench, and they can't smell themselves. They're the worst type of people, because if they were to hear the word of God, they would react to it because it would step on their toes, and they're too holy anyway. Well, they think they're holier than God. It is a terrible thing of arrogance that has occurred. It happened in Israel at the time of uh, Matthew, when at the time Matthew wrote this, in Matthew chapter 5, verse 32. At the time Matthew wrote this, 
It was a time in Israel when marriage was falling apart and everyone was self-righteous. All the scribes, Pharisees, and hypocrites, they were getting divorced, saying, well, I've never committed adultery. And Christ made it very clear they did it in their hearts. So they're all self-righteous, but they're covered in dung, and they can't smell themselves. And because of that, and because they do not wake up to Christ's message, in August of 70 A.D., Jerusalem is destroyed, and women are raped, and men are slaughtered. And it's a terrible thing. And actually, this is brought out in Isaiah, the parents eat their own children. They get so hungry in starvation. And usually the Jews were known for loving their children. But instead now they're starving to death. So they cut them up and eat them. It's a terrible thing to go under the fifth cycle of discipline. And the one thing standing between us and the fifth cycle of discipline is your attitude toward the word of God. And if you make the word of God number one in your life, you might have enough impact to keep the coming storm clouds of the fifth cycle from enveloping us. There's terrorism right now going on all around the world. And the Islamic community is going nutso. And they are salivating to get into these borders and to do something horrendous. And not just a little bomb. Oh, they are trying very desperately to get hold of what are called dirty bombs. It's a lower form of a nuke in which they could kill hundreds of thousands of people. And they'll do it if they can get their hands on it. And the only thing standing between it, between that and us remaining in prosperity is our ta attitude toward the Word of God. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege to study this portion of the Word of God. May we come to learn the importance of Bible doctrine. And we pray for our president that you will keep him safe and that you will give him wisdom during this war against terrorism. And we also pray, if it be your will, that you will continue to shield us from the uh, terrorist and from any uh, evil attack against us. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen.